changed uh, through the conversion of my parents. And it's such a joy to share this message because it is a transforming message. And uh, I come from a Hindu background. My parents were both very uh, devoted Hindus. They uh, worshipped their own uh, set of family gods. And I was part of that upbringing. And it was um, in those days when uh, my dad used to be a worker at the sugar mill uh, when the, you know, they were indented laborers. My grandfather was an indented laborer from India. And so my father became one of the workers in the sugar industry and worked in the sugar mill for almost 40 years. But during that time, they were devoted Hindus. We had our own temple. The Hindu community was very strong and... Um, it was uh, in those early days of my experience to look at some of the pictures of the Hindu deities that we worshipped. And uh, they seemed to be very angry with us all the time. And that is why we had to appease them with sacrifices. We had to, you know, do the sacrifices every week, whether it was a black rooster or chicken or, or goat. You know, that was kind of the ordinary uh, kind of way in which we brought some kind of uh, peace into the family. But my mother, who was possessed, she was possessed with uh, uh, these gods as we knew them at that time. And uh, she would get into a trance, a very, very, you know, uh, kind of experience that we as children uh, were afraid of because when she got into that trance, it was not a very uh, a good sight to see because she, her eyes would bulge out her tongue would be out and she would be sort of in a very vicious way coming, you know, to all of us and pronouncing, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know whether it was blessings or curses, but it was actually a demonstration of evil. It was definitely a demonstration of evil because to me, at the, looking back, I knew that it, these were not gods, these were demons. And uh, my dad, who was uh, working in the sugar mill, had to go to work at different times. And so he had to, you know, sort of stay up probably all night at some times because these um, demons would not leave. They would demonstrate their powers, you know, going on for hours. And so I, you know, I just sensed the, the my dad was really wanting to get my mother completely set free from these spirits. And so he goes to a temple, a Hindu temple, not far from where we were living, and asks the priest over there to exercise or get rid of these spirits. But th that priest in that the other uh, bigger temple uh, was also, you know, <laughs> sort of possessed in a way. And so when he saw my mother becoming, uh, you know, uh, trance, uh, sort of in, in a trance, he would... He would look at her and say, no, no, you, these gods are more powerful than the gods I have. So he could not do anything because the spirits were not able to exercise the spirits out of my mother. So my dad was very disappointed. He came back home and it was after many weeks um, that he was walking back home from, from the sugar mill that he saw a man on the roadside. It was a white man. In fact, in those days during apartheid, uh, whites were not allowed to come to black areas. And um, we were an Indian community and no white man ever came into the Indian community. So this white man, <laughs> who was a missionary to the Indian community, he was speaking to a group of Zulu people on the roadside with his ukulele. <laughs> and he was singing and preaching to them. And my dad, who was passing by, stopped and he looked at this man and he listened to this message that this man was preaching and he was talking about Jesus. He was talking about the love of Jesus and how Jesus healed and delivered and set people free. And my father said, I really want to know who this Jesus is. And so after the man had completed his talk, he went to him and said, please, can you come and pray for my wife? You know, she's, she's really needing uh, help. And so this great man of God, who, I, who, I, who became my mentor, came home to our little house and, uh, you know, we lived in a tin shack. 
because we were, the poverty was quite uh, visible. <laughs> and so we, he walked in to the house with two of his assistants. These were Indian ladies who had been, you know, converted. And they came in because they spoke Hindi and Telugu. You know, and they were sort of the uh, assistants to the pastor that came. And as he walked into our house, my mom, who was in the kitchen, became aroused with the demon spirits. And the, the spirits began to activate, you know, her, her, her body. And uh, the presence of this man in our house was so powerful because he carried the presence of God. Mm. And so my mom uh, was brought by my dad. And as he, as he stood there, as <laughs> she stood there with, with the, in front of uh, this man of God, the amazing thing happened. This man, with great authority, said to, he didn't speak to my mother, he said, in the name of Jesus, devil, we command you to leave. And he, he said that in such an authoritative way that the demons in my mother began to scream out. And it was around about 10 different screams that my mother fell down to the floor and began to froth at her mouth. And we thought she died. And my sister said, this white man came to kill our mother. <laughs> and a few minutes later, my mom got up and, you know, asked in Tamil, the language that we spoke at home. She said to my father, what is this white man doing here? She had no idea what had happened. She was delivered. She was set free. And my dad said to her, this man came to get you better. And in that moment, this wonderful man of God began to explain to them the gospel. They accepted Christ. And on the 4th of June, 1954, they were both baptized in a river. And then soon after baptism, my mother was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues, which was completely unknown to us. We didn't know what speaking in tongues were. And now, you know, we, we saw the transformation. My mother was different. And then her sisters, my mothers, my aunts and my uncles came along and said, why did you accept this white man's religion? Christianity is a white man's religion. You shouldn't have accepted it. We are Hindus, you know. And there was a big sort of commotion. She said, listen, my father said, please, I have gone to the temples. I've asked them to come and get my wife set free. And no one could do it but Jesus. And he broke the temple, he broke our little house temple that we had and, uh, you know, threw all the idols off and we became committed believers. And my mother was uh, illiterate, she couldn't read or write, but when she became a Christian, she began to read the Bible and began to write as well. And, you know, we were nine children and those days there were no TV, no radios. Mm -hmm. So... Um, the families were huge and she made sure that nine of her children went to church and all nine of us became Christians Hallelujah. and she became the intensity and this is what I, I was amazed at that the intensity of her devotion to the gods that we worshiped before was now turned to Jesus Amen. and that intensity is what we need and we saw that in our mother the transformation that took place was so enormous. I mean, everybody spoke about the change in my mother. The whole community said, this woman is changed. She's no more getting that, you know, trance anymore. She's a believer. She's following Jesus. And her life began to radiate with the love of God. She went to pray for people. She went to witness. She became an evangelist. Wow. And then she prayed for one of her sons to become a missionary. And so the Lord called me at the age of 13. I heard the voice of the Lord uh, clearly give, giving me instructions to be his servant. And uh, I was still in school, but I became a very uh, committed believer, baptized at the age of 13. And I went on to become um, a, a kind of... <laughs> A student pastor in the school and shared my 
has too many. And uh, <clears throat> shared my testimony with my friends, especially my Muslim and Hindu friends. And they said, but how can that be? And many of them received Christ during my schooling career. And I thank God for the opportunity he had given me to share the good news of the gospel. So one of the things that Hinduism teaches is that God is in everything. Uh, the word is pantheism, where, you know, whether it's a snake, whether it's a rat, whether it's a cow, whether whatever it is, God is in it. So don't touch it, don't kill it. So when a snake used to come around our house, we would say, no, don't touch the snake. It's, you know, God is in it. And so that was the, the deception that we had uh, given to us by Hinduism. So, um, but when we came to Christ, we realized that we were completely transformed. Um, someone said, nature forms us, sin deforms us. <laughs> Schools inform us, asylums reform us, but only Christ can transform us. Yes. And that transformation is what we need in our lives, and we've seen it in our parents. And so when I became a believer and committed my life to Christ, I committed myself to becoming an ambassador of Christ. And so I come here today not representing Christianity, but representing Christ. Hallelujah. Because modern Christianity has moved far away from biblical Christianity. And so we represent Christ. We are Christ representatives, not representatives of the modern neoliberal Christianity that we have today. And you know, and that's a very sad thing, isn't it? That England has become so liberal in its uh, outlook that um, the true essence of the gospel is being sort of eroded by the invasion of uh, all these other religious groups. And uh, you know those religious groups. I don't have to mention them. Mm -hmm. But you know how the enemy comes with deception to come and take away the essence of the gospel. You see, Satan's strategy is not, to, not for you to deny your faith, but to dilute your faith. Mm -hmm. That's his strategy. His strategy is for you to not to deny your faith. Oh, I'm a Christian. No, no, no. He wants you to be so diluted that when the enemy comes, when there's you know, pressure, you will give in. And that is what we need to guard against. You need to come to the word of God because the Bible says the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is quick. That means it's, it's very active. Right now, God's word is active. It is active in, in doing what God has commanded it to be done. Jesus, God said, my word will not return unto me void. It will accomplish that for which it is sent. Yes. Hinduism, uh, well, I don't know who counted this, but someone said they worship 330 million gods. <laughs> 330 million gods. I mean... Can you imagine? I mean, we had our own fam set of family gods, and uh, each god had a different um, kind of um, purpose. We had the god of uh, education, the god of uh, you know um, healing, the god. We, all these different gods represented different things that we, in our own Christian faith, uh, would love to have. Because you know what, this god here helps me in my education, mm -hmm. and so we worship. All the children had to go and sit there and you know, worship this God. And then uh, for safety, we had another God. And that God was very angry all the time. You know? <laughs> and so we had to worship that God and then sacrifice something different from the God of education. So we had all these different aspects of Hinduism uh, when we grew up. But thank God for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. The gospel of Jesus Christ transforms us. The gospel makes us new and uh, gives us the hope that uh, Hinduism doesn't give. We are the only, uh, Christianity is the only uh, faith. And I don't even want to call Christianity a religion because religion is man's effort to reach God. Mm -hmm. that's right. But Christianity is God's effort to reach man. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a big difference, isn't it? Yeah. And that's a big difference. And so... 
I, I want to encourage you today to get back to the biblical uh, essence of the gospel. Amen. That you will never let it go because you are being attacked from all sides. Right now, there is a great attack on the deity of Christ. Amen. The deity of Christ is being attacked in a most you know, vehement way by religious groups. Mm. And that is Satan's strategy. That is the, the only thing that he wants. He wants, when he came to him in the wilderness, he said, if you are the son of God, make these stones into bread. So that is his whole plan. He wants to deceive. And the one world government, the one world order now, is actually creating, do you know that the the World Economic Forum made a statement, the only obstacle we have to for a one world government are true Christians. <laughs> We've got to rid the world of true Christianity and then we can have one world order. <laughs> that's what Schwab said sure. in Davos. Mm. He said that's the, the, the only hindrance we have. And, and can you imagine what the devil, the devil knows that. Mm. If you are a true believer, you are a target. <laughs> And let me tell you, persecution is going to increase. Yes. Yes. Your faith is going to be tested mm. to the hilt. Mm. And if you are not ready to die for Jesus. You see, and, and God is not concerned about the 99% we give to him. Mm. He's concerned about the 1% we keep back. Yes. Yeah. And until we make that transition of saying, Lord, I give my 100% to you. You know, the, the scripture that comes to mind is John chapter 2, where Jesus comes into Jerusalem and he and he's sort of hailed as king of the Jews. And, you know, uh, people throw down garments and, you know, palm leaves and all that. And they hail him. And the Bible and John makes this statement in John chapter 2, the last verse. He says, but Jesus did not commit himself to them. For he knew all men. And I looked at that and I said, Lord. Why didn't you commit yourself to them? And the Holy Spirit whispered to me, he said, because the quality of their commitment was such that I could not. <laughs> so the question I asked myself is, what is the quality of my commitment to Christ? That he is not prepared to commit himself to me. Because we have to come to that place where we are saying to God, here am I, Lord. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise to thee. And when we do that, when we do that wholeheartedly, in fact, don't be surprised that the narrow road has very few <laughs> disciples. The narrow road is always narrow and very few walk in it. The broad road, that's... Secular Christianity, there's, there's two types of Christians, religious Christians and there's radical Christians. And I hope that you become a radical Christian, Amen. unafraid of the faith that you carry in Christ. Because if Christ is worth possessing, he's worth proclaiming. Yes. And I love what uh, Daniel Chan, you know, does right there in Trafalgar Square getting thousands of people. He's not afraid. We need to have that kind of, you know, zeal, you know, zeal to go forth and evangelize because if the church does not evangelize, it will fossilize. Yes. Yeah. And in England, unfortunately, I heard the other day that the Muslims bought off 400 churches that were not being used and turned them into mosques. They are almost... 800, what is it, 850 Sharia courts now in England. Sharia courts. They are places where, you know, they are being invaded and Christianity is just being sort of, you know, downplayed. And even uh, the media sort of lifts them up and give them all the media time. But anything Christian is brought to the low, you know, lower end of news. So we are, you know, in a, in a world that is constantly um, at war with the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a place that we need to be walking in, not your denomination. Amen. Denominations 
you know, two little boys were walking and the one boy said, uh, tell me, uh, why don't your father come to our church? The other boy says, he belongs to a different abomination. <laughs> and some, and some, of these, some of these denominations are abominations yes, sir. because of human tradition, because of tradition. The gospel has been, you know, killed because of tradition. But we have to come into the kingdom of God. Seek ye first what? The kingdom, kingdom of God. The Baptist church? No. Uh, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Seek ye first the Anglican church? No, the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the Methodist church. No, the kingdom of God. So you see, the emphasis, the focus must be the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And that's the environment that we need to be living in every day. We are kingdom citizens. We are in the world, but not of the world. Amen. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Yes. Because you take nothing with you when you leave. Yes. You take nothing. Even the atheist knows that. The atheists believe that their God is a subatomic particle. <laughs> they will argue. Something out of nothing. I mean, they got to have more faith than believers to believe that something came out of nothing. Yes. You know, and so, you know, to me, I want to, I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters. Seek first the kingdom of God. Get into the kingdom of God. And how do I get into the kingdom of God? It is to move into the environment of the kingdom. Whoa. We've got to move into the environment. Not the, we, 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 we are happy going into a denomination, but it is f greater to go into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is within us, in, in us, around us, and the fellowship of the saints brings the kingdom of God into focus. Amen? Amen. That is why when I came to England this time, I'm on my you know, mission to start to, to, to establish a church. We, we, we actually planted a church, Pastor Vince, who has been my great love and supporter <laughs> in South Africa. He's been such a blessing to us in supporting our ministry. And his vision has always been, let's start a new church. And he says, I'm in Vista, come. And so we started, we launched last week. Praise the Lord. And JJ was there, <laughs> yeah, to help us along. Yeah. <laughs> and John. So we thank God that the church has begun. And um, we want to associate with other ministers of the gospel so that we can have the kingdom mentality for Vista. So that we don't sort of work in isolation. And I don't like that. You know, in my ministry, I've been, um, I've been through quite a bit. Uh, I celebrated my 50 years in ministry last year. Praise 50 years. And uh, that's a, a long journey, but the Lord has kept me. I've never been to hospital for 50 years. Amen. Wow. I've turned 72, just a little lower than Bill. <laughs> and uh, you know, his, your birthday was... On Thursday, and he's just a little older than me. <laughs> but thank God for His grace, isn't it? Yes. Because when you give your life to Christ, He becomes your great physician. Mm. And um, yes, my journey took me through uh, quite a number of ministries. I started with YWAM. I cut my teeth with Youth with a Mission uh, as a missionary to Madagascar, Mauritius, and Seychelles. And those were the early days. And then when I got back to South Africa, I became a pioneer for Scripture Union. Mm. And I worked in schools, helping Scripture Union groups to be established in all our Indian schools. As you know, during apartheid, we couldn't go to any other school. We had to do it in the Indian schools. So that was my, my task. And so for the next seven years, I sort of worked with Scripture Union and many of the young people that we took on inter-school camps became believers and some of them have become pastors. Wow. And that is an amazing thing. The other day when I was at my niece's wedding um, a few months back, uh, the, the pianist, the, the musician who, who saw me walk into the room, into the hall, he left his piano and ran towards me, grabbed hold of me and he said, Pastor Abel, 
Oh, I'm so glad to see you. I didn't know who this guy was. <laughs> and I said, tell me who you are. He says, I'm Martin. Don't you remember Martin? That, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he said, I'm Martin, the naughty boy that you spoke to at Clarewood High School. <laughs> I accepted the Lord in your meeting at the Clarewood High School. I mean, I was amazed. I said, what you naughty boy? <laughs> I said, so what happened to you? He said, well, I became a school teacher. And then I became a music teacher. And then I graduated from theological school. And now I'm a senior pastor. Wow. I said, wow. You never know what your seed can produce. The seed that you sow is so important. Never miss an opportunity. Get hold of every opportunity you have to share the good news of the gospel. Amen. In Oxford, when I was just uh, walking the other day, uh, not when I was the last time I visited Oxford, I saw a man sitting with his guitar. He was, he had his little, you know, cloth over there for donations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I sat next to him, not far from uh, uh, the center of Oxford. And um, I sat next to him and I, I said, oh, I love, I love your guitar. And he said, oh, that's nice. You do you play? So we got on conversing. And then I shared with him about my testimony. And he said, wow, this is great. And then I prayed with him right there on the street and said, you need to accept the Lord. And he agreed with me, be it, you know. And uh, you could see that he's been through quite a long journey in his life. Mm -hmm. But you see, you never miss an opportunity. Amen. The transformation that took, care, uh, that took place in my parents has been a great pillar of strength to us. The intensity of worship that my mother had for her own gods was now turned over to Jesus. Amen. And the Lord has come to us and we are saying the kingdom of God is a place that we need to be in. And, this, and I want to close with this, that there's this three environments that, that the, the Holy Spirit showed me. And um, you can be living in any one of those environments. The first is the world. The world environment is a, um, an unrighteous environment. And uh, when you live in the world environment, unrighteousness will always be dictating your thoughts and causing you to fall. Then we have the religious environment. The religious environment is a self-righteous environment. <coughs> and what religion teaches is, we'll put on a new coat over you. We'll make you look good. You go to church. You'll be a religious Christian. You know, that's your religious environment. It's a self-righteous environment. But then you come to the kingdom of God, which is a righteous environment. But I found that many people vacillate between kingdom and world. And that's a problem. That is a big challenge. So we need to be very careful that we don't vacillate between the kingdom of God and the world system. Yes. We need to be in the kingdom of God. If you are in the kingdom of God, be a citizen of the kingdom. And unfortunately, this is my last statement, as preachers always say. <laughs> The church has become an embassy for the kingdom. The church has become an embassy. Why do I say that? Because we have a lot of people applying to get into the kingdom, but the staff of the embassy keep them in the embassy for the rest of their lives, never letting them experience the kingdom. They left conferences about the kingdom. They will take you on a three-day window shopping of the kingdom, but I tell you, they never get you into the kingdom because if they do that, then they lose what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So we need to be careful that the shepherds that we have are kingdom-minded shepherds mm -hmm. and not shepherds who are focused on, you know, making themselves rich. And you know what's happening right now. Big names are falling down. Mm -hmm. Big names in ministry are coming down. The judgment of God has started in the house of God. Yeah. 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 
And we need to be aware of that, that we don't move away from the essence of the gospel. The essence of the gospel as the New Testament has given us. The relationship with Jesus Christ. When Christianity began in the book of Acts, it was based on relationships. When it went to Antioch, when it went to um, uh, Mars Hill, <laughs> where was Mars Hill? Athens. Athens. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So when Christianity moved to Athens, it became a philosophy. <laughs> when it went to Rome, it became a religion. Mm. When it came to Europe, it became culture. Mm. When it went to America, it became big business. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you see the, the evolution of Christianity. Yes. I mean, that's what happens. But you see, it has to go back to the relationship in the book of Acts. And finally, I close with this, Pastor Vince. Many churches have moved from the book of Acts to the book of, num of Numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a very serious flaw in the church. Yes. So let us be aware of that. Amen. 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 So, for the few minutes that we have left, may I encourage you to uh, make a recommitment to kingdom values, to what God is saying. And if you have not done that, then I invite you and I'll pray with you. And maybe someone of you may have a special need that you want us to pray for. We'll pray with you and let God bring great uh, deliverance and joy into your life. Amen? Amen. 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 <coughs> Sorry? <coughs> yes, well, for those who are watching uh, online, and may I ask you also to uh, look at the <coughs> message that that Jesus gave, come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. So you can also give your life to Christ because giving your life to Christ is the greatest thing that you could ever do in this world. So I invite you to give your life to Jesus and may the grace of God give you the strength to become sons and daughters of the living God. Amen. 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 So if there's anyone who needs prayer, please don't hesitate. Come, we'll pray with you. And um, we don't want to miss that opportunity. Amen. Amen. Dr. Abraham, I definitely want prayer for um, a dedication to the kingdom.